<laughs> I was away in LA for the past three or four days, attending together with my staff, or our staff, the Religious Education Congress. And I did have a choice to spend another day there, going along the missions and returning tomorrow. But as Jesus would say, I have longed to eat this Passover with you. Oh. I wanted to spend time with you this evening, and that's why I came driving all the way directly to this place. Oh. But what a surprise, or a shock. I come here to learn that I'm a person of interest. <laughs> Mila, I love you. <laughs> I don't know if you heard about uh, this Filipino woman, wife. She was a party animal. Everybody. Twice a night she would go out to party, and her husband was mad with her. And finally he put his hands down and said, Honey, promise me that you will not go partying after burying me. At least that night, stay home. <laughs> and sure enough, he died two weeks later. And so the funeral took place. He was buried in the cemetery. And as they came back, people were wondering. I said, what will she do? Because her husband said, if you go partying the night of my burial, I'll take my way out of the grave and come back to haunt you for the rest of your life. <laughs> and sure enough, there she was, partying. And so the friends came together and said, Hey, don't you remember what your husband said? What? That he would dig his way out of the grave and come to haunt you for the rest of your life. I said, yeah. Aren't you afraid that he would come digging his grave? She said, let him dig. I buried him upside down. <laughs> Our faith teaches us that we are party animals, that we feast, we eat, we drink, we break bread together, but we party at the table, not just any table. And this partying also pushes us to break bread with others at the other tables, in our homes, in the homes of the poor. And so the new evangelization that I'd like to present to you today could be summarized in this one silly joke, that we are made for partying, that we eat and drink together that it is all the time about breaking bread together. Even Hilak Belek, the English writer, would say, wherever the Catholic sun does shine, there's always laughter and good red wine. This is how I have known Benedicamus Domino, he would say. And it is this, being a party animal, and if you didn't pick it up, I'm referring to what? The Eucharist, the table, the bread, the wine, the body, and blood. And when you eat that body and drink that blood, as St. Augustine would say, you become what you eat. And what do you become? Or better still, who do you become? Another Christ. And Christ can never lie in the tomb. Three days after resurrection, the friends of Joseph of Arimathea got together and they were quizzing him. Joe, we know that you made that tomb for yourself. You did it with so much of care, so much of money, time, energy, attention went into that. How come you gave it away to Jesus of Nazareth? And Joe said, why not? After all, he needed it only for the weekend. <laughs> if you are a Christian, believe me, death is for the weekend. 
And so, when you talk in terms of new evangelization, what I'd like to share with you is this. If you talk of new evangelization, we take for granted that there is what? Old evangelization. Good. We have some smart people around. Yeah. <laughs> Only one spoke up, I'm glad. <laughs> Or think of what we call primary evangelization. That would be the good news of salvation, that Jesus Christ has risen, that you and I who died to our sin in the waters of baptism will rise to a new life and will live forever. That is the evangelization part, where we reach people who have not heard of Christ and we bring to them the good news that God is good all the time. And he loves you, not because you're good, but you're good because God loves you. That would be evangelization. Going to people and telling them, God is love. More than that, God is in love with you. That would be evangelization. <clears throat> Or telling them, for God so loved the world that he gave. Not something, but someone. Not just anyone, but his only son. Now, that would be evangelization. Or going to people who have not heard of Christ and telling them, you know, Christ so loved you that he gave his body as food and shed his blood as your drink, so that eating it, drinking it, you might live forever. Saying that to those who have not heard of Christ, that would be evangelization. That's what we call primary evangelization. Now what is secondary evangelization? Or what we refer to today as new evangelization. That would be going to people who are de-churched. The first part, primary evangelization, people who are unchurched, people who have not heard of Christ, people who do not believe in Christ, people who have not heard the gospel of Christ. But the second part, secondary evangelization or the new evangelization would be reaching people who are de-churched who are staying away from the church, who do not want to come to church though they are baptized, who call themselves nuns. <coughs> that would be new evangelization. In other words, reaching the pews, touching those people who sit there and sleep week after week and waking them up to new life, that would be new evangelization. Pope John, the, uh, John Paul II, saying to Pope John Paul II, when he went to his homeland, Poland, he went to a little place called Nuo Junta, a paradise of workers that was created by the communists, but actually a place very cramped, very depressing. And if night after night, something beautiful happened. All these Catholic workers who were subject to domination by the communist rule would come out and plant crosses in the open air. Not hundreds, but thousands. And in the morning, the communist soldiers would come and take away all of them only for the crosses to come up again at a later time. And Pope John Paul II, when he went there, realized how faith was kept alive. And at the same time, for every 10 that survived and flourished in their faith, they were the double the number that had fallen away. They had passed through the dark night of the soul and they gave up their faith. And it was when he was in Poland for the first time that he came up with the term new evangelization. And then later on, when he met with the bishops of the Americas, that was in the year 1983, 
he would pick up that term, new evangelization, that he used in Poland and exalt it to another height and say, this is going to be our approach. This is going to be our style. This is going to be our attitude and our way of evangelizing in the future. And he would point to nine years later, to the year 1942, and say, that is when, not 42, um, 92. It was the 500th anniversary of the discovery of America the 500th anniversary of first evangelization and say, that's what we are moving towards. And uh, he would announce new evangelization in a very serious way, in a very systematic and organized way, and invite people to evangelize, re-evangelize those who are already baptized and those that are sitting in the pews who are still to be moved by the Spirit. And so today, I would like to make a mention of that. What happened in 1992? That was the 500th anniversary. And one year later, John Paul II, 10 years earlier, announced that there would be a World Youth Day in Denver. And people said, Denver? What? Where? It was insignificant. And people who are experts, who have been watching these World Youth Conferences said, it was always held in religious cities, in prominent cities, in pilgrimage centers, in places known for a lot of spirituality and never in a place like Denver. And so they thought that it would be a catastrophic failure. But what happened? More than half a million people showed up, youth. And they were there, energized, re-evangelized. And it was then Pope John Paul II would say, from now on, we go this way. And when he died, three years later, Pope Benedict XVI, who knew the mind of John Paul II, would pick up the new evangelization and say, this is not a short-term project. It's not a band-aid solution. It is a long-term vision for the church. Just as the church in Poland died, unless and until it was taken care of, so will our case be. Pause for a moment. Think of the prominent countries like France, Italy, and other Catholic countries. Today, what happened? They're all secular countries, not religious anymore, much less Catholic. And today, who are the ones who are brimming with faith? First is Brazil. Second is Mexico. And the third is actually America in number. And these are three countries that were never on the map face of the earth or found a spot on the map 500 years ago. And so notice how things are changing. Those who had it lost it, and those who did not have it are thriving. And new evangelization is about going back to those Christian countries, to those Catholic settings, to the families, in order to bring them up, to bring them to contact with God. And so today, I'd like to present to you just seven little points. I know that you had a lot of speakers, and I also know that this is going to be a long week for you, a long evening for you. And so let me be brief with what I want to present. New evangelization is about fostering or facilitating or promoting a loving relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, in catechism, what did they, what did they teach us? A whole lot of stuff. A lot of information was fed into our minds. And we were forced to learn much. If only we know that faith means relationship. That faith actually needs to translate into trust. And if so, you will not have fear of death. 
And so the first idea of new evangelization is that it is a call to foster a personal, intimate, loving relationship with Jesus Christ. It's about inviting people to enter into a friendship with Jesus. It's about going and telling people, God is good, God is great, God is love, and God is in love with me. I reciprocate that love. How about you? In simple words, this would be the first article of the new evangelization. Getting people to connect with Jesus. Just pause for a while and go back over the confessions that you made over the years. I purposely use the word in a nagging way as confession. I'm actually being sarcastic. How many of you come and confess? Hey, confession should take place in Santa Rita, jail, <laughs> not in the chapel. You come here for reconciliation. And what do you say? You know, my spouse was ill, very seriously ill and I couldn't leave him or leave her, and therefore I missed Mass. Now go over that for a minute. What does the mind say? What is the attitude? What is your logic? Is God such a taskmaster that he would want you to leave your spouse who is ill and go to the church? I yell at people in the confessional. I tell them, hey, if you leave your spouse and go for Sunday Mass, that would be a mortal sin. Because you have to be where God wants you to be, and you belong right where your family is. And so notice how that often we go to church on Sunday out of a habit, or out of a sense of Catholic, It starts with G, ends with T, it has a U-I-L in it. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, good, guilt. I'm pulling your leg. Instead of going for a date, instead of going for an encounter, instead of going to meet someone that you love because you are in love with that individual, now, that would be new evangelization. If I were to ask you for a show of hands, how many of you have fallen in love with Jesus? Many of you will raise your hands because you are in Cursillo, you are in the Couples for Christ, you are in a charismatic meeting, or you are in a, a Legion of Mary and so many other things. Those are beautiful. But do all these immersions, involvements, and engagement help you to strike a personal, loving, intimate relationship with Christ. If not, we are wasting time. We gather together on Sunday because we love someone and we want to be with that someone. Think of the time when you were dating. I mean, later on you started intimidating. That's different. <laughs> Men folk, am I right? Oh yeah. And so, when you go for Mass, is it impelled by love? That would be the first point. New evangelization is about inviting people to enter into a loving, personal relationship with Christ. And how do you do that? Give me one word. Prayer. Prayer is a dialogue, a conversation. It is leaning on to God. It's depending on God. It is looking to God. It is just walking with God. That would be prayer. In other words, a relationship. Do I have a good, personal, intimate relationship with Christ? The second, whatever we convey of Christ, we need to convey with ardor, with zest, with interest, with energy. Even Aristotle would say, if people listen to a speech, it's because of the enthusiasm of the speaker. If the speaker is dead, if the speaker is boring, if the speaker doesn't come alive, if the speaker is not on fire, who will listen to the speech? 
The next time you switch on the TV and there is an advertisement, maybe for a bottle of water, take a look at it. 